Hello everybody, I'm Happy Pinecone, and welcome to another Draw Me video where I talk about stuff as a speed paint place. Today's illustration is going to be a girl opening a magical book of spells. It's called Library of Spells. This is the second illustration to my mini prompt series where I draw artworks based on random prompts I thumbnailed as a warm up for my anime heroine video. I should probably give this mini series a name. What a convenient transition because I got just a name. I'll call it Nighttime Tattles because all the prompts share the same universe and are all happening at the same night. Long story, I'm making some sort of greeting card fable series with them. I'm currently writing one for the Library of Spells and will soon post it on my website which can be found in the description below. So without further ado, take a seat and draw it new. Books. We know them, we love them, we tolerate them. Whether as a pastime to give your imagination a whirl or to finish that summer book report you're expected to submit, everyone at some point reads a book or two. I'm a bookworm, not a passionate bookworm per se, I'm not into classics like Great Expectations and Scarlet Letter, and I'm not completely into the idea of being forced to read every summer and be expected to turn in a lengthy report on it, but I do enjoy reading nonetheless. I love good stories that can take me into new worlds far better than what isekai anime ever showed me. Why else am I inspired to write fanfiction and make my own stories? Anyway, since this video is showcasing a speed paint on an illustration based on prompts called Library of Spells, I thought why not and list down 5 books that changed my life forever. Whether it's because it strengthens my love for stories, or it teaches me a valuable lesson about life, or I just got something cool in return for that book. I'll mention my thoughts about them and I hope it'll be entertaining for you guys. This video is inspired by an art YouTuber named Rie A. I watched her stuff recently and I enjoyed it a lot. Aside from her wonderful art pieces, especially her traditional ones, she also talks about the books she've read and her thoughts on them. She probably does this better than what I'm about to do. The point is, if you're a bookworm or an artist or a little boat, I suggest you check her out as well. You won't regret it. Now and then, as Barney once said, Books are fun, books are great, let's get down with a book today and talk about the 5 books that changed my life. So first off, we have Drama Stilton and the Secret of Cockerfer Castle. I'm not sure if it applies to everyone, but back in the day, Drama Stilton was overage. It's all over the bookstores and kids would own at least one book from its franchise. I think there was also a TV series. Anyway, every year my school's book fair would have tons of Drama Stilton books for sale. And on special occasions, a mascot would show up. I think the series is usually the first thing that kickstarts a child's interest towards reading. I mean, the main reason why most kids wouldn't like to read is because of how thick a book looks and that there are no pictures to entertain them. On the other hand, Drama Student has those covered. Their books can easily be finished in a single sitting and they have plenty of well-drawn pictures of Drama and the other characters doing stuff. And if that's not enough, even the typography is really nice to look at. They're big and sometimes feel animated by the way they are placed in the pages. At its core, Drama Stilton is about, well, Drama Stilton, the editor of the Rodin's Gazette, a well-known newspaper in New Mouse City. He's minding his own business when he's suddenly forced to do things that he normally wouldn't do, whether climb a mountain or find an ancient civilization or enter a haunted house. Along the way, he writes about his adventures, which, funny enough, becomes the book you're reading, and learns something new about himself. The stories told in the series are quite humorous, despite using the same formula for more than 20 years. I think they are trying to add some variety by making a lot of spin-offs, such as the Tea Sisters, Creepella Calcifer, the Kingdom of Fantasy, and those alternate universes or timelines that involves different characters who just so happen to act like the main cast. Sometimes it works, other times it feels tired. Jerome Stilton and the Secret of Calcifer Castle was my favorite of the series. The story was straightforward. Drama Stilton was having a writer's block when he's suddenly taken by Crippella Calcifer, a strange mouse who has a crush on him due to the events of another book. Apparently, Crippella's entire family gathered at the Calcifer Castle to discuss about their great-grandfather's will. Of course, that fact gets forgotten rather quickly because of the chaos. Drama witnessing the apparent weirdness of the Calcifers and their lifestyle was funny and entertaining. I would read that book over and over again just to see those shenanigans. And now that I think about it, it also told a really valuable lesson about accepting differences. Amidst all the chaos, the story starts with Jerome having a somewhat negative perception towards the Calcifers because of how strange they were. However, he eventually realized that they may live a completely different lifestyle from most mice he knew, but they are, at their core, really good-hearted people. 
He may not see Cropello the same way as she does to him. He nonetheless sees her as a good friend. Strangely enough, I think this book was able to capture this lesson better than that animated Adam's Family film that I once saw. Because unlike the film, I don't feel an ounce of spy or ulterior motive in the book. In a way, I think that book was the start of my literary journey. It became my favorite book in the franchise and encouraged me to try out more books from Jerome Suzu. By the time I grew tired of the series formula, it made me more open to finding other books to read. So next off we have Emily the Strange, Dark Times by Rob Redger and Jessica Gruner. Fun fact about this one, this is the first book I've read from the novel series, even though it's technically the third book of the four book series. It was the first one I bought and it took me a while to find all of them, so I had to read the books out of order. Anyway, Emily the Strange was apparently a god icon at one point and I was around 13 to 14 years old at the time, where most people are in the phase of finding their individuality. So I embraced her character a lot. Though I never gone god, you could say that I wasn't exactly the rebellious type. Back then, I was growing tired of reading Jerome Stilton, so I wanted to change a piece. It gave me something new to read about, and as a result, I ended up collecting the series. Dark Times is about Emily time traveling to get this mysterious black rock, but stuff happens and she traveled a bit too late. Stuck in the wrong timeline, Emily must use her brain to survive. She got help from her ancestors and must also deal with the ancestor of the antagonist from the first book because he also wanted the mysterious black rock. With that premise, I knew right away that I probably need to read the earlier installments sooner or later to know what's going on. With that said, the overall plot is easy to follow. There's a goal, there's a villain, and there's a conflict. There's some lore bits but not to the point of making me feel lost. The story was written in first person where it's as if Emily's writing her diary. It's interesting because I get to understand her personality and thought process based on how she wrote down her thoughts as well as the diary's overall layout. Throughout her diary, I can tell that she's an imaginative loner who prefers being by herself but nonetheless embraces relationships. I could tell based on how she describes the people around her, as well as the number of messy doodles and pictures across the pages. She also seems to be a good note taker because not only she lists down her plans, she's also able to transcribe conversations that she had with other people or conversations she eavesdrop on. Even though it's the third book of a four book series, it's, to me, it's a good entry to the franchise. It made me curious of what kind of world Emily's living in, and I recommend you try it out too. But of course, if you can, read everything in order unlike what I did. It makes a big difference. So next off we have Neil Flambe and the Marco Polo Murders by Kevin Sylvester. I got this book from my school's book fair after winning certificates from a poster making contest. I was initially skeptical with the book at first, but I was encouraged to try it out. And before I knew it, I'm trying to collect the entire series. Even now. Anyway, Neil Flambe in the Marco Polo Murders is the first of the Caper series. It's about a 14-year-old chef named Neil Flambe who owns a four-star restaurant and is also a detective who helps out the police solve cases using the power of his extraordinary sense of smell. In the first book, several well-known chefs in Vancouver were murdered in a similar fashion and that may be connected to Marco Polo's adventure. Neil Flambe had to solve the case and in the process gets framed for it. The book was humorous, but at the same time really thrilling with its PG-13 love of violence. Sometimes it has time to have some bits of romance in between. The characters work well together, everyone seems so well-rounded and likable, with the exception of the antagonist, which makes a lot of sense in this kind of story. Everyone has some sort of backstory and it's really nice to know about it. I like Neil as a character because he's not your run-of-the-mill protagonist. He's short-tempered, cocky and immature, but also ambitious and good-hearted. He also possessed the one thing that most cocky people don't have, the talent to back up his confidence. And on top of that, he never stops learning. So he has the capacity to respect those who are better than him in certain ways. I also like how grounded the story's world is, despite having a somewhat unrealistic premise. The fact alone that Neil was 14 and yet owned a restaurant and worked with the police was a bit of a stretch. However, it's framed relatively realistically. To start, everyone in the book acknowledges Neil's age as something unbelievable to begin with. Neil had to go through a lot of belittlement as his enemies tend to underestimate his age, even becomes irritated whenever he's called a kid. Furthermore, in order for his parents or any older person to trust him into running a restaurant, he needed adult supervision, which was through his cousin Larry. 
It's clear that Kevin Sylvester did some research because the key aspects of the book is the food knowledge and the story of Marco Polo, which are very important to solve the case. Marco Polo's story is definitely researched, so that the writer will be able to add his own spin to it. I definitely love the way food was described in this book. It's something too fancy, but it's enough to entice me and wish that Chess Flambe is real. I really want to try out his potato dish. The art in the book is also cute. Reading this book really helped me in my reading adventure overall because it teaches me not to judge a book for its cover. Eventually, I read the second book. The gift certificate made buying two books at once possible. Next, we have 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher. This is one of the few times I like a book because of a school requirement. Back then, I had to write a literary analysis on how 13 Reasons Why and It's Kind of a Funny Story cover depression and mental health. At first, I borrowed from someone else before eventually buying my own copy. 13 Reasons Why is an interesting story about a boy named Clay who one day received a box filled with cassette tapes labeled with numbers 1 to 13. Those tapes were actually the suicide note recorded by Hannah Baker, a classmate whom Clay had feelings for. In those tapes, Hannah claimed that there are 13 people who drove her to her decision and that whoever received the tapes are one of those people, and that it's their job to pass the tapes along or else it gets broadcasted to the whole school. Desperate to understand why, Clay spent one whole night doing the most psychologically intense binge listen ever as the story of Hannah Baker unfolds. The book discusses how one's actions, whether intentional or otherwise, have consequences that will affect others. It also doesn't frame Hannah Baker as completely in the rights either. 13 Reasons Why seems to be written with two unreliable authors, Clay and Hannah respectively. The former because of his personal biases towards Hannah, and the latter because while several of the actions done to her are malicious, primarily sexual harassment, it is possible that some of the other cases aren't the same way. Some of the people who were mentioned in the tapes were there either because they were ignorant with their decisions and failed to consider Hannah's feelings, or they didn't respond to the situation the way Hannah hoped for. While I haven't watched the Netflix adaptation, I read enough material about it to notice that the way it was written was like the most angsty writers in Wattpad decided to team up and made that chaotic mess. It's quite a shame because when it was announced for the first time, I was excited. I thought that it's going to be as amazing as the book, but then it didn't and went so far as to make two, three more seasons for a story that should have ended a long time ago. So read the book instead, it's worth your time. In a more lighthearted note, that book made me discover my love for analyzing stories and how it relates to the real world. For the literary analysis, my English teacher complimented me for my insightfulness and my ability to get out of the box. Not to brag, but I received a really handsome grade for it as well. Some of you may have noticed that I briefly mentioned the book It's Kind of a Funny Story and stopped talking about it. Well, personal circumstances kept me from appreciating it to its entirety, so it didn't impact me as much as 13 Reasons Why. But nevertheless, it's also a good read, so call it a minor recommendation. Finally, we have And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. After I discovered that I enjoyed psychological mystery stories, Agatha Christie came knocking on my door with And Then There Were None. And Then There Were None was about 10 strangers being invited to Soldier Island, only to be killed one by one. Eventually, they concluded that a killer walks among them. What I found interesting was that for a mystery novel, there's no actual detective. Although they were trying to figure out who the killer is, none of them officially stepped forward to solve the case. Or if they did, they are already dead. Another thing is that the 10 strangers weren't necessarily good people. They were in this mess because the mysterious killer believed that they committed crimes that the law couldn't touch and therefore must receive justice. It's a really interesting take on what justice is because this killer firmly believed that everyone deserves to die without due process. It's that kind of god complex that you could get from Death Note. I personally think that In Dead There Were None wanted to capture the psychological tension of its premise rather than the mystery itself. Another reason why no one exactly stepped in to play detective was because no one trusts each other. Everyone was paranoid and afraid of each other. Furthermore, as people die one by one, those who remain grew even more afraid. Some started seeing things Others became hysterical, others even believed that this is God's way of punishing them for their actions. The story was a thrilling read and I suggest you try it out if you have the chance. The ending was especially really good. I won't spoil for those who, who hadn't read it, but the ending really ties everything together. This video turned out longer than I expected it to be. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed this video and illustration. 
There are more books that I enjoyed and I wanted to talk about them, but maybe on a later date. Like I said many times, I recommend you trying them out when you have the chance. They are really good books. Speaking of which, I recently updated my webcomic Live 7 8 with two episodes. One regular episode and one special episode. For context, I cut out some scenes before uploading the former because I thought they were too dark in contrast with the rest of the piece and felt un out of place. However, some were curious and asked me if there's a way to see the original cut. And that's where the latter comes in. The plots are both almost the same, it's just that their contexts are completely different. If you're curious, you can check it out. It's available in Tapas and Webtoon and the links are at the description below. Staying at home for a while longer can feel dull at times, but books can give us exciting adventures at the comfort of our homes. Have you read any of the books I mentioned? Was there a book that changed your life? I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. That's the same for comments, questions, suggestions, and or anime recommendations. And while you're at it, like the video and subscribe if you want to be updated with my latest video. That's all for now. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.